Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Isdainer, managing member of Isdainer and Company, and I just want to welcome all of you this morning for what I hope will be a fascinating and interesting and informative program. J just a, a little background. As a, as a large regional CPA firm, we, we really s seek strategic affiliations that enable us to provide services to our clients wherever those services may be needed, whether it's locally, nationally, or, or internationally. And in order to enable us to do this, we're a member of an organization called MSI International, which is a global network of independent accounting and law firms. And we're able to utilize the services of accountants and lawyers worldwide to help us to achieve the goals of our clients, wherever those goals and, and challenges or strategies may, may take them. Uh, a lion group uh, who, who's going to be the speakers here today uh, is an organization that is a, a, a sponsor and an organization involved with MSI, and I've gotten to know them through that affiliation, and uh, we, we of course, appreciate their, their sponsorship of uh, MSI, but more importantly, they bring to the table for us resources and services to help us and our clients to achieve many, many goals. Um, particularly, uh, Alliance core mission is to help our, our clients and us as a CPA firm to take full advantage of federal and state tax credits, incentives, and deductions that could be available for those companies. And that includes things like the research and development credits, hiring credits and incentives, areas involving energy efficient commercial buildings, uh, deductions. All these things are, are the, the, the expertise that they have that they bring to both us and to our clients, and, and, we, and we really welcome the partnership that we have when we're able to work with them. So uh, thank you, and thank you for being here today. Um, I, I'm going to let them um, talk about them, themselves a little bit and, and to introduce the speakers, but we are, we are um, I'm delighted to have today uh, speaking to us and talking about le legislative issues, uh, Rick Lazio and Mark Everson. Uh, Mark is uh, a vice chairman of the Lion, but um, in his prior life was a former commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, served, I think, from 2003 to 2007, if I recall. Um, for good years. The service <laughs> worked all right then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and prior to that, served in the administ Bush administration as a former deputy director for management for the Office of Management and Budget, was a former controller of the House of the Office of Federal Financial Management, and then worked in some administrations even prior to that, I believe. So uh, Rick Lazio is uh, senior vice president at, at Alliant, but uh, was formerly a U.S. representative in New York. Um, is, a, is an attorney who has uh, practiced uh, first as a prosecutor and then in private practice uh, doing, doing commercial uh, litigation, also has expertise in the housing industry as well, low-income housing industry, and, and served in that capacity, I think, as chairman of the uh, housing committee when you were in the, in the House. Sure. So uh, we're, we're really delighted to have both Rick and Mark here to uh, share with you the insights that they're going to be able to bring from their years of experience. And I don't know if I'm turning it over to you or to the staff from the Lion to, uh, to get the program underway. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Just to piggyback a little bit on what Scott said, um, Align Group, I started about 12 years ago in helping them build the bridge between associations and networks like MSI and educating CPA firms as well as now industry partnerships that we work with on the incentives that their clients can benefit for and grow their bottom line and also retain clients. So really excited to be here and kind of educate you guys on what the outcome and the outlook will be of the midterm elections as well as you know the new IRS commissioner being appointed and, and where the IRS is today but also to share a little bit more about our firm and our team we were about 750 people I started we were about 50 people so it's been a, a long roller coaster ride but it's been a lot of fun Brian who is my managing director of our New York City office actually heads up our North Northeast office and has been with us for over eight years now and working together, we are able to help small, mid-sized businesses anywhere from a million in revenue to a couple hundred million. And our sweet spot really is about 30 to 50 million in helping them analyze whether or not they can benefit from an incentive like this. So if you have any questions or want to learn a little bit more, we've done over 33,000 studies, 7 billion in cash back to American economy. So would love to spend a little time with you afterwards as well. Brian? Good, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for having us, everybody. A couple things you should know about these two. They're off to a good start. Okay, it's a little funny. You guys have been a little funny already, but they used to want their twos on these ratings, so you can figure out. I think they're going to be happy. They'll be happy in the car talking about their three ratings later. So, but um, but I wanted to at least share uh, before I turn it over to actually Rick. 
just a lion for you. And number one is thank you for your support and uh, and for the ability to work with you guys as clients. Really, what we've done is, as each step mentioned, over 750. I think we're close to 800 or so people, and um, and really we built our practice around supporting you all as CK firms or advisors to small and mid-sized businesses. And so, you know, we do, as you Steph mentioned, we've done lots of credits and incentives and R&D credit, 179 capital D, et cetera. But the other thing we want to do is make sure that we give CPA firms and advisors horsepower behind it. So when we build a strategic advisory board, we have, as you see on the bottom here of the slide, we have industry experts, right? And the thought behind that is, you know, as a CPA firm, when we're dealing with architects or engineers or software developers or manufacturers or system integrators, we're putting together teams, right, that can speak, they, they say this, but geek to geek speak, right, which is how many layers deep can we go if we have engineers speaking to other engineers or system integrators, contractors, etc. So we want to be able to supply, supply that horsepower to you all. But the other thing is, you saw in a couple slides on the strategic advisory board, we've got some notable figures, um, well, I'll leave this slide up, is Dean Zerbe and Don Levy, who are both former senior counsels to, to the Senate Finance Committee. And so they're very, you know, they were very instrumental, a lot of the tax law that happened over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And so we want to make sure that we have the spirit and understand the spirit behind some of these laws and how they're applicable today. And then, and then the other part of it is, you know, with Rick and, and Mark, we look at the enforcement side of things. How does the IRS view this? How does the IRS like to see it? We like to take very conservative positions. Mark says this best, um, I do steal this quote a lot, but which is, your clients should get every dollar they're entitled to, but not a dollar more, right? So, so we're very careful on taking that conservative position, et cetera. So that, that's one piece on our credits and incentives. The other part of this, using our strategic advisory board, we're not lobbyists, of course, but at the same time we have that connection and we like to bring value and to be able to share insight and thoughts to what you can take back to clients. And so the thought today is to cover three areas. One is to talk a little bit about the legislative piece, what's happening, what's likely to happen, what's going to happen in lame duck session. Rick's going to cover that. We want to talk a little bit about the IRS, uh, what, what Mark sees in coming down the pike here, and some of the resources or lack of resources and how that's affecting you all. And lastly, we'll cover, I'll cover some of the emerging industries that you should pay attention to. Say, hey, based on what we're seeing out there, from an R&D or credits perspective, these are the types of companies you should be looking at. It's going to be, it'll be a good uh, understanding the tax plan potentially better. Um, it'll also be an opportunity to be a prospecting or something like that. So let's take some of this. So that said, um, Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Scott, thanks so much for uh, the invitation to be here with you. We're really pleased to spend some time. Hello, with each other. Hello, Mark. Mark, Mark, during the court, who would have guessed that an IRS commissioner had a sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> and you would have been right, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and, if you think, and if you think that the Just IRS you know, guy ought to be page the hard down, ass, page you know, down, in, in the presentation, I'm really the nice guy. He's really the mean one. Oh, yeah. He's bitter because he testified before Congress, got beat up a little bit, and he holds grudges. It's 50 you know? times, 50 times, and it was never it was never fun. So the point of that is, chime in. You were the Kavanaugh of your, of your era. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I went to Yale, and uh, I'm, I'm willing to admit I did drink too much. Honestly. Oh, my God. Uh, so... I guess to Rick's point, though, we're both used to taking abuse. Yeah. Uh, so some one more than others. Yes. Yeah, so if you've got something to say as we go through this, or you say that's not right, yeah, just stick your hand up, ask a question, and let's make this conversational because it'll be sort of more fun. Right. Right. So, anyway, as it can be. Right. As it can. So again, so. Uh, Brian had went through the fact that we have a strategic advisory board, and you saw some of the names up there, but they include uh, former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, who joined and is helping us on the cybersecurity side, the first Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, former Governor of Missouri and Senator of Missouri, Kit Bond, uh, who uh, helps us out as, as well, Bob Riley, former Governor of Alabama. Uh, and so we've got a number of different people who have had public roles and who are now advising the Lion Group on a number of different issues that impact small businesses, small and mid-sized businesses as well as tax policy. Uh, just a little bit on my background, because I understand there's some people who are in the banking or financial services industry that may be in the room. Could you, that, yeah, a couple of 
So my, I, w I served on the Financial Services Committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, I, uh, when I left, I, I ran against a, an obscure woman for a Senate in New York. <laughs> and um, you know, some people would say only an idiot could lose to her, but in fact, that's possible, and so it did, apparently. <laughs> Uh, but uh, just goes Hillary Clinton. I'm talking about who who, uh, who was the candidate in New York State in 2000 for Senate. I left my house seat when Rudy Giuliani dropped out, and I was recruited to fill in for him about four and a half months before Election Day. We all know how that ended up, right? So uh, I was there, and then I I ended up as uh, CEO as I left the house. I had to give up my house seat. Uh, CEO of the Financial Services Forum, which was an organization of uh, 20 financial services institutions, uh, all global, all diversified, and at the CEO level. So, for example, Hank Paulson, who was then the CEO of Goldman Sachs and became Secretary of Treasury, was the chairman at the same time when I was the CEO of that organization. I stayed there for about three and a half years and then got recruited to J.P. Morgan, where I stayed for seven years. And I was an executive vice president there. I was a direct report to Jamie Dimon, who was, who was then and is now still the CEO of J.P. Morgan and uh, sat on the executive committee. So a little bit of background in terms of, uh, of my experience in financial services. And I sort of stayed active in, in some of those spaces. So happy to take any questions if you've got any questions in this space. What I'd like to address um, with Mark, and Mark will join in as he sees fit. Uh, I will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to sort of cover where we are on taxes Extenders, technical corrections, tax reform 2.0. What's the what's the likelihood of a, the next big tax bill, and what out, what's out there in play right now? So please do stop me if you have a follow-up question. I'm not being clear, or whatever the case is. I'm happy to happy to try and address it. First of all, as you all know, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was a monumental uh, tax achievement. Uh, a trillion and a half dollar tax bill. It's the largest tax reform in 31 years, in more than a generation. Last major tax reform, of course, was in 1986. At that time, Ronald Reagan was president. He had a secretary of treasury, Jim Baker, who was on point. He had delegated him, said, this is your responsibility to get this bill done. Reagan was pulling people into the Oval Office and <coughs> working it hard. They had 200 people in what they characterized as a war room in the Treasury Department working on it. They had bipartisan support from Bill Bradley, some of you may remember, the senator from New Jersey, was a big proponent of, of tax reform. And with all that, it took two and a half years to get the bill done. Fast forward 31 years later, and so, Trump gets elected. Yes? Don't rush over this point about bipartisan. The real difference is the Democrats had the House. So uh, those folks had to, they had to deal with Rostenkowski. Yeah. And Chip O'Neill. That any deal that was going to go. They were firmly. That's right. So that is just a very important point to remember for everything that Rick is going to go through and now in terms of what will happen. That's the difference. Yeah. So so again, as I said, thirty one years ago, Trump gets elected in November of sixteen, announces that they're gonna move on tax reform as he gets sworn in on January twentieth of twenty seventeen. They begin to introduce pieces of legislation, eventually it becomes a, a entire bill in the late spring of 2017. By December of that year, he's signing into law the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So that moved through the system so rapidly, it is amazing, honestly, that there is not more technical errors that were made. And uh, so when we think about, you know, why did they do things this way and you may have a different view as to why the, the, the rationale or, or, or how these provisions ought to have been organized or put together. Part of it was there was a sense of urgency to get this thing done as quickly as possible to, one, fulfill a campaign promise by Trump, and number two, to make sure with a tight margin, Republicans had a, a very tiny margin in the Senate, 5248 at the time. Um, that, that they would not lose anybody and keep everybody together and maintain momentum and get the bill done. So in fact, that's, that's exactly what happened. But there are some, some errors that uh, are lying out there right now, and uh, a couple of them, I don't know if you've run into the QIP issues. This is the Qualified Improvement uh, Property. These are, these are leasehold improvements 
you'll see most of them kind of in the retail restaurant kind of space. Um, and these are situations where they were eligible, these improvements were eligible for bonus depreciation. And as you remember, before this current law, there was a 50% bonus depreciation. So they had favorable 15-year depreciation schedules. Well, in drafting the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, they left this section QIP completely out. And so not only do they not, are not eligible for the 100% bonus depreciation, but actually they revert back to 39 years. So uh, that's a, a, absolutely a drafting error. It's, it's not what was intended. And these are the kind of changes that they will try, the House and Senate will try to make sometime soon. And I'm going to get to that in a, in a moment as to why that doesn't happen you know, tomorrow. Um, the other issue, which is one to, to track, is on NOLs uh, and the, lo the lost carrybacks and the way the drafting occurred. Uh, they, they, they should have said the period beginning December 31st, 2017, and instead they said the period ending December 31st, 2017. So there's some question about whether retro they have a retroactive tax, tax hike for a certain parties to certain taxpayers in that space. There are probably a number, there are a number of other technical issues that are popping up, but those are two fairly significant ones. So what are the odds of them getting corrected in the near future? And the answer is no more than moderately high. You would think these would be easy to get done, but in fact, because Democrats felt as though they were not part of the process, they did not have their priorities addressed, they didn't feel in, invested at all in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They have no real interest in improving it. And so the Senate, which deals with the filibuster rule, you all know what that is, right? You need 60 votes to overcome a filibuster. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was able to get passed with a simple majority in the Senate because they used a legislature. We're talking about technical corrections and NOLs and what are the odds of that. So and, wait, let, me, yeah. let me ask you a question though, because Rick and I have been we, we go around the country and do events like this and stuff. Three or four months ago, you were you were more optimistic about technical corrections yes. and things getting done in the lame duck. Why? What has happened in the last several months that make it less likely that there's something that gets done in the lame duck? Well, I think first of all, it's it's increasingly obvious that number one, Democrats just do not feel any ownership in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and they have no interest in really improving it because they didn't agree with the direction that Republicans took on the bill. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Democrats' prospects for, for taking the House and maybe the Senate in next week uh, have improved. And so if you look at those numbers, for example, right now, as people look at them, the Senate contests, and that's going to greatly impact what happens in a lame duck session, if there is a lame duck session, whether technical corrections are done, whether the 23 expiring provisions, which are mostly energy related provisions, are addressed in the lame duck session, whether they get kicked over to next year, and if things get kicked over to next year, what are the prospects for tax cuts 2.0, which is what a package of three bills that were passed in the House. So lots of things tied up in, this, in the partisan makeup of the House and the Senate. The Senate 100 members, one third of the Senate is up every two years. This cycle, in a sense, favors Republicans because they are lucky to have only nine, nine of, the, of the 32 races that are up, are uh, 33 actually, are Republican, are in, are in states where Republicans currently are, are in, in incumbents in the Senate. Uh, so the overwhelming exposure is really for, for Democrats, which is a lucky thing for Republicans and a very tough environment for them. Historically, uh, the president's party in the first midterm election loses a significant amount of seats. In 94, for example, uh, Clinton's first term, midterm elections, they lost 50, Democrats lost 54 seats in the House, they lost the majority for the first time in 40 years. It's only been two times in the post-World War II period, the recent period, where presidents in their, for the midterm elections in their first term have picked up seats. 
Uh, so it's a very rare thing, and interestingly, this was in Clinton's first term, it's his second term, but Clinton did pick up seats, which was a bit of an anomaly in the midterms in, in, uh, in 98. And by the way, this sort of flips around in 2020, 20, 22 of the Senate seats that'll be up are Republicans. Right. So, so that, you know, if you look ahead, the thing about Washington, I, I went to Washington the first time in 82, and everybody was saying about how companies, public companies, they never got past the next quarter. And I've, I've always been struck by every business I've been in, you do all these surveys of uh, long-term market share and commodities prices before you make an investment. It, uh, totally unknowable things for 10 years down the road, but at least you're trying. In government, they never look past 24 months, which is the next election. The next election, and right. That's, that's the driver, so so that'll happen already. Yeah, and, and 10 of these seats, these Senate seats, democratically held seats, are in states that Trump won in 2016, most of them by double digits, by more than 10 points. So most analysts that are looking at this now believe that Republicans will likely pick up one or two seats in the Senate, so they'll have a net pickup in the Senate. They have current 51-49 majority, but in the House, I think the likelihood, most people are looking at this, it's sort of the mirror image. The, the, the states that are competitive and more potential pickups for Republicans tend to be in these states that Trump did well in, tend to be rural states. The demographics are different. On the House side, the battleground are largely suburban areas where there's a large demographic. So Democrats have a 25 point lead on what they call generic ballot tests. Who would you rather control Congress? Uh, women versus men, and that will be an important factor I think you'll see next Tuesday, and they are, I think most people that are, that are objective are in play, believe that Democrats will, will likely, maybe not by much, but will likely win back a so majority. Do you think there's an impact of uh, Pittsburgh or the caravan, all this yeah. All these things that are happening at the So end? these external events have a big impact and very volatile electorate, right? You know just that the water cooler and talking to neighbors is like, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about politics these days without getting someone ticked off. <laughs> and they, it, you know, it, it's a, people are very energetic. So the way they measure this in terms of polling is they call voter intensity. How excited are you to get to the polls to send the message? And for most of this year, Democrats had a very significant lead in this space. Uh, as of the summer, Democrats had an 80% intensity um, t sort of turnout uh, outcome level, and Republicans were trailing in the 67, 68% level. Now, without saying anything about Kavanaugh and the merits, it absolutely changed that dynamic. And so after the Kavanaugh hearings were over, Democrats had bumped up a little bit in intensity to 82%, and Republicans had moved from 68 or 67% to 80%. So they basically were closed. Republicans have a edge in, in how they're handling the economy. Democrats have an edge in terms of, in, especially in some of these swing districts, which party they would, voters would rather see control Congress. So the latest NBC Wall Street Journal poll had Trump at 47% approval. That's his high water mark. He's been underwater since he was elected president. He's not had one day where he's been above 50%. That poll sort of had news, like that was about a week or 10 days ago, I'm gonna to get to your question, had good news for both parties. News that Democrats felt good about, which is they still led a little bit on intensity, that they were leading on on on, um, on this generic ballot test, and that they were still doing very well in terms of this gender gap, which was important in in uh, these suburban areas, and that some of the minority coalition was more energized, had been more energized. So, good news for them. Republicans had some good news, and that Trump's approval numbers were improving. That generally is good for, uh, from a coattail effect, uh, and that they were leading on, on important issues like which party do you trust more on jobs and the economy, so they felt good about that. So both yes, things. Yes, question. Yeah. Does intensity relate to um, 
currently registered voters who are going to make it to the if the vote? Great or, question. Or does it relate to you know, efforts by both parties to get newly registered? It's, no, it, it, it relates to asking a voter whether or not how badly they they want to get to the polls to vote, and they're registered voters. However, if you if you look at the swing districts, the districts truly in play, that gap narrows. So actually Republicans do better in terms of likely voters in some of these swing districts, but there's still a gap and Democrats still lead. Um, so what Mark has asked about the, the, the mail bomb incident and the, um, and the bombing in Pittsburgh, whether that has changed the dynamic, and the answer is nobody quite knows. They're in the field right now polling. My guess, my gut is yes, because it's a it's a volatile electorate. I think Republicans probably had some momentum, and I think that momentum is either slowed or reversed, and um, and these things could change very quickly. And because these races are so close, many of these races are within the margin of error. If you look at, for example, the race in in uh, Senate race in in Florida. The governor's race for the Senate race in Florida, that is right dead heat right now. The Senate race in Missouri, dead heat. There's a number of them that are just right there. One of the candidates up or down one point, they're down one point, yeah. which with, you know, th that's within the margin of error. So it's, it's like a, basically it's, it's unknowable right now. And I'm interested in how you feel, but I, the way I see this is there are a lot of people, leave the Republicans and the Democrats out of it, just talk about sort of the inter independence. Right. There are a lot of people who sort of... Been, like this guy, but things are going awfully well. His businesses are booming and everything else, and they they sort of get further away. They've gotten used to all the noise, but the the events of the last week, I think, are rather shocking, and cause a certain number of people who've sort of gotten to an acceptance level, let's say, of Trump and the Republican agenda, to sort of pull back and re retrench. I think that's it's, happening. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to know what impact it will be. I mean, the caravan is right now that is hard to measure. For some voters, it will energize them right. that are that are focused on the immigration issue in terms of more restrictive immigration policies. On on others that, that feel like they want more liberal immigration policies, that may energize them as well. So the point here is that we have an extremely volatile electorate with a lot of very close races, and truly the outcomes are almost unknowable. But if you look at the numbers right now and where the trend lines are, I would say the likelihood is Republicans continue to control the Senate by a small margin and Democrats take the House. And so we have split, split government in terms of the two chambers, and that will impact lots of things on taxes. We talked about technical corrections before, the extenders bills, um, the, those those <coughs> provisions. If my view is, if the if the Democrats take the House, they will they will not be anxious to take it up in lame duck session. They would likely rather take control of the House, take the gavel in the Ways and Means Committee, and begin to have hearings and and offer some of their their priorities and initiatives on their own on the House side, uh, and be in a stronger negotiating position. So I think probably if that happens, some of these expiring provisions will lapse. If some of them will be renewed probably by the summertime of 2019, and they, when they do get renewed, they will probably be re retroactively renewed, as has been the history of dealing with provisions that have expired that are temporary provi provisions. So talking through that with your clients, it's a little bit of, you know, we don't know, ex people, people who are on the, the tax writing committees could not tell you if they were here right now what would happen. So, yes. Quick question. Potential corrections rather than these standards. Yeah. Couldn't they use budget reconciliation for that? Great question. So, budget reconciliation can be used once a year, once every fiscal year. It is a process that is used uh, in relation to a budget resolution. So, you have to have a budget re resolution. So, they have used it. <coughs> Once during the past fiscal year, which is now over for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that's how that passed without having to get the 60 votes. Now everything that they do will require 60 votes until they pass a budget resolution. So the only way that all that happens is if Republicans control the House and the Senate, which means, in my view, the odds of getting a, a Republican-favored tax bill done in a lame duck session or in the next Congress are very small. 
So let me uh, let me know. make another comment on this. Uh, I think that the package, the tax package, was too big at a trillion five. five. It ran right through the deficit. It, it totally at variance with everything that Republicans stand for. In order to do that again, I, I think that you're getting to a point where there will be people who will stand up and say, I'm going to you know, put my body down on the tracks before you get a budget resolution. And it'll be a more difficult conversation to get to what you just suggested. The, to have the reconciliation, you've got to have a budget. And I think we're going to get to a real conversation about the deficit pretty soon. Yeah. But, yeah, I, so I, in other words, you I, know the provisions themselves. The, budget, the, 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 yes. the process. So, you have to cut a deal with the others. With the others. Now, both parties are going to have to have. <laughs> As was the case earlier this year, you know, I don't know if you were on this or not, but there actually was a technical, minor technical corrections bill that had to do with the ag sector, um, and it was done. But Democrats, in order to fix an obvious mistake, wanted a change in the law, which actually was a boost in the low-income housing tax credit. That's what will likely play out when it comes to corrections, technical corrections, and in terms of the expiring provisions. Most of them, most of the, uh, the expiring provisions are provisions that, that Democrats, uh, are, they will, my view, will get some of them, and some of them will lapse. If nothing is done, they will lapse. Um, one of them, 179 capital D, is the, the energy efficiency provision. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but this is a provision that is available for designers of, of publicly owned buildings. So obviously the public sector can't use a deduction. They don't, have, uh, they don't pay taxes. And so the, the law allows the, the public sector to allocate the deduction to a designer of the building, an architect, an engineer, a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that provision, that provision now has is expired temporarily. I testified in front of the Ways and Means Committee on this point uh, in the spring, and I think that's one of those provisions that 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 will survive, but probably won't happen until the spring of of 2019, in my view. So that, those things are ha you know are are in play. 2.0, which is this package of three bills, the House of Representatives passed, the Senate has not touched. One of them makes permanent the expiring provisions in, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, mostly on the personal side, the sunsetting provisions. Um, including marginal, you know, individual marginal rates. Uh, that's a big price tag of almost no bipartisan support, meaning the Democrats are supporting making those provisions permanent. Then there's another bill which has to do with, with expanding and enhancing certain retirement uh, uh, vehicles, including traditional IR IRAs, um, and affecting things like mandatory distributions. And the third has to do with being able to write off up to $20,000 in expenses for new or startup companies. And those second two smaller bills have some Democratic support. They're more likely to move in the next Congress than I think anything that would make permanent the expiring provisions. So sometimes people also ask, okay, when, so, so when, when might we see the next big tax bill? And in my view, that will not happen because of the polarization in Congress and because of the deficit, which will become a bigger issue. We'll have a trillion dollar deficit in the next year or so. We're on track for that. Uh, until the expiring provisions come, it comes close to them actually lapsing, and that's at the end of 2025. So December 31st of 2025, there'll be some sense of urgency. And just like the 01 and 03 tax cuts, if you remember those marginal tax cuts, when they, when they came back uh, to be extended, uh, there had to be a deal, and some of them were dropped, and so they were allowed to expire and reverted back to prior law. Some of them were extended. I think the same might well happen in this case, but it will be a time where both parties will feel like if they want to keep any of the bill, they're going to have to cut a deal and and have some a type of arrangement where some of the provisions are saved and some of them lapse and go back to prior law. So um, let me sort of go from from there, uh, let's assume that Rick's right or the experts are right and that the House turns. First point I would like to make is, um, while I, you know, I profess being a victim because I had to testify 50 times before Congress, 
I would say to you that those were always good experiences because I believe in the oversight function. I think that, that the Congress, uh, I think they do a lousy job on the legislation by and large. Thank you. But the oversight, <laughs> the, over, the oversight is really important. Every time I went up there, before we would go up there, there I'd be in a conference room with 20 people. If you're going to be going before Ways and Means. There are like 35 members. They each get their five minutes. They get, they're going to ask you whatever they want to ask you about, even if the subject is charitable hospitals. They want to ask you about a matter here in the Philadelphia area. That's what they're going to ask you about. So you, you have to learn your agency. And occasionally, your guys will say to you, oh, you know, Congressman Lazio is going to ask about boom, boom, boom. And, and we do this. He doesn't like this, but we do this because of X. And I would say, well, it sounds to me like he's right. Maybe we ought to look at what he's saying. And, and that's what really happens. So if it flips, and, and the Republicans have not been doing oversight. They just have sort of said, OK, you've got this. Take, take it away. It's, it's been very light. When that changes, and you have a series of Democrats chairing these committees, they will be very difficult conversations <coughs> with a number of the agencies. Think about EPA, or Interior in particular, VA, a bunch of them. And, and um, that'll be a change, and it'll be tough for the administration. It'll be tough for the administration to get good people to come in and serve, because it won't be as much fun. And it'll just be a very, it'll be a very different uh, scenario. And the Democrats will have important choices. Do they, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, we want Trump's tax returns. Ways and means, ways and means can get Trump's tax returns if they want. Uh, but I've heard even Waxman has said, the old dean of oversight, be careful what you do. Don't, don't put your foot down on the accelerator. Uh, be selective in what you're doing. And we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But that'll be a big change. Um, the tax reform. Uh, I would say to you, from my perspective, this is a very dramatic set of changes. And the most important changes, I believe, are in the international arena. Uh, big changes. And we don't know what the long-term impact is going to be on our economy or the world economy. I think we had to get more competitive. We've done that. I applaud that. But you're seeing other nations taking actions to try and uh, close that gap. You got a, the, the, a lot of things are in flux. You may have read this in the paper just the last day or two. The UK is imposing a tax on the digital operations, digital businesses. 2% will kick in in 2020. They're going it alone because they're tired of waiting for the OECD and others to, to cut out some sort of worldwide scheme. They're, they, we are in a state of flux, not just in our own system, but across the globe. And that'll, that'll play out over a long period of time. People ask us where we go. We were in Denver last week, and a fellow stands up and he says about 15 seconds about his own situation. Then he says, "Should I be a C corp or a flow through?" <laughs> and and uh, uh, so people are asking all the time, "What are what are, what is the what are the ramifications of this major reform? What should I do?" What we tell people is, the system, as Rick just indicated, is going to be relatively stable for a period of time. But it's going to take a long time for the rules to be clear. The IRS was still writing rules in 2003 when I got there for the 86 Act. They were still issuing regulations. So, uh, and they were still going through litigation uh, about what a provision means. So this, some of the details will take a real long time to get out there. So what should you do as a taxpayer or as, as a CPA? Uh, um, you are a financial advisor. What you should do is look to the substance of your business activities and do a real diagnostic of what am I going to do with this business? Am I going to grow it? Is it going to be overseas with overseas operations? Am I going to sell it? Are my kids going to take it? Do I need cash from it? Or can I shelter earnings for an extended period of time? As one really technical tax expert that we have said to me at, right after the passage of the bill, he said, uh, used to be that the overseas C Corp was the big shelter. Now it's the US domestic C Corp. So there are changes here, but again, the big picture is you should try to know 
your business of what you want to do, and then work with your advisors to to uh, figure out what are the right actions okay. to take. One, one thing to this is that also in terms of advising your clients on this choice of entity issue, the the, the marginal rates for the C corp are permanent. The the deduction, the 199A deduction, and the marginal rates uh, for the in, on the individual side are both expiring at the end of 2025. And so we don't know for sure that they will ever be made permanent or that they will be extended. So something else to sort of consider when you're right. thinking right. about choice of entity for tax purposes. So um, but just a couple points on the IRS, take, and then we can take, take any, any questions. If Brian has one or two things he'd like to say. Um, the IRS in 2013 with the political targeting scandal, it got, it got sucked into the political debate in a, very, uh, in a way that really had very negative repercussions for the agency. Nobody likes the agency. We knew that. I understood that when I ran it. Um, but, but it had a reasonable amount of funding at that time. I actually was able to get a little bit more from my colleagues, former colleagues at the OMB, and then from the Hill. And that's that's a hard thing to do because I I can't correct me if I'm wrong, but I doubt any member of Congress from Pennsylvania or senator has ever come back and said, "Vote for me." I got more money for the IRS. You ever hear yeah, that? Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of town hall meetings. Yeah, yes. So so it's not popular, but it needs a certain amount of funding. And what happened was with that targeting mess, and then the way the, even the president handled it. He said, there was no criminality here. Remember, he did that Super Bowl interview with Bill Riley. There was nothing wrong there. And, and uh, that just inflamed the, um, the Republicans. And, and in fact, I always say that the, it's sort of like, remember the Watergate babies came in in 74, Waxman and Dingle, people like that, who they carried through their whole careers abuse of power by the White House. And it was sort of a, a touchstone as to how they ran committees and did things over their congressional careers. You had the Tea Party, the co convergence of the Tea Party people arriving, just as this happened, big bad IRS overreach of government. So there's a, the, the agency's in a tough space because of that and the fact that the Republicans admitted to cutting the budget. They took a billion dollars out of the budget it's about eleven billion dollar budget. They took a billion out uh, at a time when there was identity theft, more international, a lot to do. Health care. Health health care exactly. They took took out out. They said we're being punitive here because of what you did. So that's a very bad place to start. Where you you have trouble getting through on the phone. The audits are down. And and if you're if you pay your taxes honestly. You want a certain a number of audits because you want others to pay their fair share. And uh, we're at a point where both sides of the house, the service side and the enforcement side, have been drawn down. And it, it really is it's, it's concerning because it, you can't just sort of say, OK, we're going to give you another billion dollars and go fix it. It takes time because Pound for pound, it doesn't have the same quality of personnel because senior guys roll off. Some lady who's been in a group here in Philadelphia, and she's, she never moved into management because she didn't want it, the headaches. But she trained every kid who came through and became, became an auditor. When she rolls off, that's a lot of talent that rolls off. And you don't replace that uh, easily. You replace it over time. So. So, and, Mark, and Mark, some of these provisions are actually added complexity on the business uh, side, right? 199A is one of them. Guilt, uh, the repatriation provisions. Very. This is a very important point. The bill, the Repu one Republican objective was to simplify the tax code, and it did for I don't know 20, 30 million Americans filers who, who individual will now as individuals yeah. just move to they will no longer itemize. That's simplification for them. For, for those of you who run or own businesses, uh, it got more complicated. So no doubt about it. Yeah. So that's it. So they've got a lot to do. They've got a lot to do, and 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 we'll, and we'll see. I mean, uh, <coughs> we'll see how it goes. Anything else, Brian? I left out, or Rick left out? We uh, any questions, comments, or why don't we move into the postcard system? It's all 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, well, one, one thing I would, if you don't have any questions, I, I do want to mention because I try and give you a little different topic. Yeah, go ahead. My, my question um, is around tariffs and with the re and I don't know if this is beyond the scope, but maybe more of a question for Brian of what your firm does, but to me it seems like there's a big opportunity for accountants and law firms and consulting firms to help small and mid-sized businesses as it relates to what I would call tariff consulting or tariff management because it seems like a lot of these companies are confused and don't know how to um, you know, kind of best handle these kind of new supply chain change mm -hmm. differences with all these new tariffs. But that's something you guys help companies so, so we don't have a consulting firm that really does advise companies on how to manage the tariff issues. However, with uh, structures like IC Disc, for example, order uh, is a way that it's a tax burden, and that ought to be part of the conversation. And obviously, some of the last things are after the, many of the business deductions were eliminated, is that R&D credit, if the employment coming on the W-2 is here in the U.S., and I think Brian will be speaking to that a little bit more so, on some issues relating to those problems or those opportunities, we can help, but, but not directly in terms of advising the company. But another thing I was just thinking is maybe you guys can share a little bit about Alliant National. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, too. Um, we work in a very limited number of areas in the code that require very detailed analysis and substantial documentation in the event that the service does take a look at, at the work. And, and it's, it's proven a very successful model because what we do is we have uh, not just attorneys and accountants on staff, we have scientists, engineers, chemists, biologists, software engineers, that they can look at a business and understand, they can understand the process that's involved in a business in a way that the person who's just the expert in the code does not. So we're able to stay constantly um, up to speed with devel developments that are taking place in an industry and also how the government, how the regulator of the service or state of Pennsylvania is looking at the activities. Because we're all over the country, this work is done all over the country, um, and it gets into certain technical areas. Over time, we have become, it's interesting, and it, it, Rick comments on this and the need of, for you to be vocal in terms of your representatives, but there's no doubt the big players, the big guys, they get in and they talk to the congressman. They, they've got plenty of representation in Washington. And it's also true that the very small players, that low-income people or really small businesses, they have a, a pretty good representation too. It's sort of this middle, the, the uh, closely held business, the 10, 50, 200 million dollar business, they are not as well understood in Washington. Uh, one of the points Rick makes oftentimes now is that that is changing and the Republican constituency typically had been uh, the very large businesses. Now there's more of an understanding of the driving of the smaller businesses. But one of the things we realized, to Brian's point, was that that they need to be represented in Washington, and their issues are are significant. And over time, we built out an office that deals with some very technical issues, um, including tax controversy. Will will. Have, be available to work with the Hill and be a, a resource there. And we've also built out a practice to do things like captive insurance businesses, executive compensation, areas that are particularly challenging. And that's that's how that has grown uh, grown up in, in the last few years. And I would just say, if you have a question like on Tara, I'm just saying that they deal with fairly complex issues. Yes. We, don't, we haven't built out a practice specifically around Tara, but listen, I mentioned at the beginning, we're here to support you guys. If you see that as a need, yeah, we do we have a conversation about it. We generally can find an answer to things. Yeah. I'd like to introduce the managing director of the uh, sort of Northeast region, Brian, who's going to talk about some of your I want to definitely yeah. thanks, guys. And if you have any questions after, we'll be here um, at the end and hang around and linger a little bit. But I thought it'd be important to at least share with you guys a little bit about 
some of the credits and incentives in the R&D credit. Um, so let me ask you this. You guys have worked with us. You have exposure to us. What types of industries come in when you think of R&D credits? What types of industries are coming to mind for you guys that qualify? Manufacturing. So manufacturing, okay. So manufacturing would be one. What else? Um, What's that? Technology. Biotech. biotech, sure. Yep. So pharm biotech, pharmaceutical. I would say yeah. technology for companies. It's like software? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So software, okay. Yep. Anything else that comes to mind? So those would be great ones for sure. So what about architects or engineers? Does that come to mind at all? Yes. Okay. So those would be, so I think, you know, the, the, thing, the thing to remember for R&D credits, right, is manufacturing was first that came to mind. So, when, so as, at this time of year, we're always encouraging CPAs, you know, you have tax planning, there's two big opportunities now, right, on the timing. One is you've got tax planning, you guys, if you guys know our process, we're really trying to do a, a dig, right, initially. That spent a lot of client time in getting estimates in front of you guys, right? So that from a tax planning perspective, it's nice to have what these credits look like. And if you've got estimated tax payments that are coming up in January 15th, right, it's a good offset to that. So that's it. And then you know, one of the reasons we want to, I want to at least share with you these industries in five minutes and some of the emerging industries is because, you know, as we've evolved in our firm, we, we did, and this, by the way, this is still a preferred way, we've done 99% of our business through CPA firms. Okay, and, and the reason being is because you've got two key components of the credit. One is can you generate a credit, and two is can you utilize it. You have owners that get really excited, right, if they hear credits, and then it's just like, okay, you've been at NOLs for seven years, this is not gonna work, right? So you have to have this balance of if it even makes sense. But what's happened is, and ESEF has been, you know, and her team have been really instrumental in this, and you, you talked about the relationship with you guys as a firm, but what had happened now is, NTMA, National Tooling and Manufacturing Association, as an example, ESEF and our team were just at. They're now owners. We've done 33,000 of these. And so what's happened is, through word of mouth, we have owners that speak to each other, right, around the country. And so someone, you know, they get together at an NTMA, you've got system integrators, you've got technology conferences, they're speaking. And so what we want to do is, is, as a minimum, at least make sure you're paying attention to these emerging industries, because if they're speaking what you don't want, right, you want them to hear this through you. We want them to hear it through you. We don't want to hear another owner. And then the other thing we've seen out there is you have some, I don't know if you have any of these or not, but sometimes we find clients that have given spreadsheets, if you will, some basic costs in, and they're like, oh, it's a minimal credit. You slide it through, right? But then what happens if that's a $5,000, $10,000 credit? They're at an event. They're an owner. They speak to each other. They're like, oh, I'm in the same business, and they're claiming 100000 or 50000 right? There's like, oh, what happened here? I'm the same business. So we want to give you those tools. So think about this. Think about manufacturing for sure. So every manufacturer, you've got the typical things like contract manufacturers, tool and die companies, right? You've got, um, so those be plastic injection molders. So that, do you guys have any of those? Are those all covered for you guys, you think, from a credit standpoint? Do you think so? Yeah. So just get your wheels turning. Technology. So let me just, and I'm going to go offshoots of all these. So you have the obvious software for sale, lease, or license, right? But then you, what we're seeing out there is really an emergence of companies that have done internal use software. So now you have companies that have spent a fair amount of dollars on customer portals, billing engines, e-commerce, moving things online, right? So, and so this, how this came up, and I'll tell you one of our larger credits, right? It's not the first time we found millions, but it was a company, uh, a firm, we were in upstate New York, and uh, kind of on the way out, this, the managing partner was thinking of high, you know, big taxpayers, really. And their biggest taxpayer was a retail furniture company, right, which you honestly would have heard of. And he said, and like, what can we find? Do you think we can find anything in retail furniture? Anybody for R&D credits? Sure. Sure. Software. Exactly. So think about how many companies there may be warehousing, distributors, trucking companies where they're doing logistics, customers. So think like that. If you hear any spend like that, like an e-step, you know, is a, good, is a good resource for that. And then architects or engineers. These are very, very strong as well. I don't know, if, do you guys have architects and engineers, Jim? Not, not a lot. So what's happened is, let me ask you this, what happens with the R&D credit above 50 million in sales or under 50 million in sales? Anybody know why 50 million is important? So what happened in 2016 as part of the PATH Act, right? So the PATH Act, protecting Americans against tax hikes, made the credit permanent, right? Number one, there's a start provision and then the third thing, the two is start provision, and third thing is AMT, 
return off for companies that are less than 50 million. So right, if you're under 50 million average for three-year gross receipts, prior to three-year gross receipts, you can use these credits against AMT for 16 moving forward. Architects, as an example, are a classic case of this because oftentimes they have five people, 15 people, 25 people in the architecture firm. But a company like that, with no, it would typically owners, right? If you think about that size firm, a 15-person architecture firm, right? Their wages are probably one and a half million-ish, right? Someone that their sales are probably three million. If you have a three million dollar company with one, two, three shareholders, what's the likelihood that they're an AMT? High, right? High. Very high, like 100 percent. So. <laughs> Um, so now, where do they go? Well, guess what? That same firm could be sitting on 100,000 in credits for these last three years, and now they can use these against AMT. So if you have architects or engineers, you definitely want to make sure that they're covered. If you have prospects that you come across, we've done ESTEF, we've done with AIA, how much? About 320 million with AIA, American Institute of Architects. So a very, very strong track record for architects. So let me share a couple, two other points. One, back to emerging industries. The other thing we've seen out there, architects and engineers have a design component to what they're doing. We can capture that design component for these credits. Now, if you think about that design component, what other companies are out there that have a design element to their business? Hint, we had one that disrupted us for 10 minutes today. What does a fire secure and security company do? They have to figure out building specs, what's needed in this, they have to figure out equipment, right? What is going to work? And believe it or not, if, I don't know if you can think of it this way, but everything these guys do, these are not, they don't, for this building, they're not going to Home Depot or Lowe's, grabbing a set and connecting it all. They have to figure out what's the best system for this, right? What's the best way to program this and sequence it? How does that work? And they're building a whole system. So it's not a, it's not a fire and security. This is the fire system in here. The whole, all, all of this, that that is all a design and engineering element to it. <coughs> so those companies will have designers, they'll have CAD people, they may have technical sales people, sales engineers. These are all very, very strong. So if you think of fire, security, audiovisual companies, companies that may be automating even high-end homes, you see that now, right? So I don't know if you have any of those, but I wanted to put that out there for you, um, right? When they're selecting equipment, what's happening is, um, you have a, a technical expertise in what equipment should be selected to, to meet the needs, the spec, and then how to make it all work together because these are all disparate systems mainly. <coughs> right? They're picking the best of this and the best of this and say, okay, I've got that. How does it work together? Um, even, we have one that even did algorithms, right, on a bridge work. So I mean, there's, it gets all crazy now. And then I think you know, the other part I want to kind of play into that, now you have IT. So you have companies that are just selecting equipment, Right, creating the overall structure, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, and making that programming and sequencing and making all work together. So these are very, very strong. And I want to continue that thought, which is now take your flat out system integrator or distributor. Grandparents open a business. Well, let's go with industrial valves. They sold them industrial valves off the shelf. That's how you bought things 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 75 years ago. But how do people buy a part now, generally? Right? I mean, if I just need a part and I kind of know what I need, I'm buying it online somewhere. Well, what's happened with these distributors where they were 100% off the shelf and they're trying to get to 60% value add. If you, that would be a common thing. 60, maybe 40% still off the shelf, but 60% value add. What I mean by that is they're, they're, they're teaching people how, someone says, I need a valve, I mean, right? it's an industrial valve. What do I need? Their expertise is saying, what are you trying to accomplish? How can we retrofit this? Should we make any other tweaks to this? How am I going to input and, and integrate my part into an overall solution? Does that make sense? So that so even your distributors that sell parts, and you play that out, there's people that actually deliver whole systems of that. They manufacturing nothing. All they do is buy a valve over here and piping over here, and a pro, they build a custom control panel over here and they make things work together with this piping system full deliverable mixing systems. Do you have anybody that's uh, a classic one that's monster credits typically are material handlers? I don't know if you've got anybody that's doing conveyor systems, material handling. Do you have any of those by chance that you can think of? So if you've got anybody building equipment, building machines, <coughs> building systems, those are those are wins. Because where are the three areas you can capture credits? What, what expense? Wages. Wages. Contractors. 
and supplies. So if you've got, if you've got, when you're delivering fully engineered solutions, you can actually capture the supplies into that solution. So all that said, I just want to, I'll, I'll stop there and I wanted to bring out what, what's happened though, and I don't have kind of a whiteboard of this, but if you think about what's happened with the tax, uh, Rick and Mark mentioned Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So if you think in, think of a company where the owners are an AMT every year, okay, AMT. What we're finding, what are you guys finding? You guys have probably run some projections for 18, right? I understand with the AMT exemptions and the, the loss of deductions, you find fewer people in AMT. Quite, quite a bit less. Right. Which means there's a spread, right, on the 6251 between regular tax and tenant minimum tax. They're likely, they're at AMT, there's that spread. Okay. Now, if you think about what happened, we can go back to 15 right now, right? 15 is still open year. But if, and again, these are scenarios where everyone's an AMT. But if, if 15 credits are generated and you're an AMT, you cannot use them, by the way, right, against carry forward, right, in 16 and 17. But if credits are generated in 16 and 17, you can use those credits against AMT, right? So right now, the opportunity in an AMT situation used to be 16, 17, and 18. With that spread that you're seeing now in 18, that puts into play 15, potentially. Because you can carry those 15 credits ordering rules require you actually to carry them forward and use them against the spread first. Then you can use those 18, 17, and 16 credits against AMT. Does that make sense? So think about what that does. There's opportunity where even if somebody's, oh, that's under 50 million, even if they're over 50 million, there's now spread. This pulls tax years into play, right? And think about all the flow throughs. Think about a C Corp that has no AMT anymore, right? Again, you can take tax down close to zero. You can't take it to zero. But you can use these you can use these credits even from a C Corp flown to the spread. So I wanted to so I wanted to stop there because I want to give you guys some industries and some things to think about in terms of tax years because what we're seeing out there is that it has opened up a number of tax years that have not been available before. So it kind of changes the game. So any other any questions I can answer for you? Do you guys have any additional comment questions for Mark or Rick? Uh, yeah. What are you seeing in the state? I, I know New Jersey just said you can no longer carry those R&D credits forward. Yeah. Are there state following suits? I wouldn't say following suit. It runs the gamut on states. Like we actually have state experts because there's 30, I think 38 states, right, of the of the 50 that have credits. And you know, it's. I feel like generally the general view of my it's very I don't like pessimist or skeptical in the states is they love pounding the fact that we have a state R and D credit but they hate paying it, right? So in New Jersey, you need to be a C Corp. It's like, all right, how many C Corps are there, right? Connecticut, you have to be a C Corp. You know, Massachusetts, you know, basically Massachusetts, the classic one in Massachusetts is they love talking about their credit. And like, you know how the federal standard, right, is here? The Massachusetts standard's like here. So they love saying like, oh, you do it. And we actually recommend that nine of our 10, we don't even go at the state credits in Massachusetts because they don't qualify. They want so much, doc I mean, they want like old school 30 year ago documentation that we've moved, everyone's moved on from but Massachusetts, but they love saying they have a credit, you know? So, it's, but, so I don't want to say anybody's following suit. I, I would say the, the following suit piece, it would be they love to say they have it and they hate paying it out. So, anyway, th thank you all for taking a few minutes with us today. Th I hope it was valuable. We'll be lingering a little yeah. bit, and thank you for all your support. And, and we really, one, really appreciate it. Uh, one final comment. On those evaluation forms, <laughs> if you think we were a three, you can... Put in two columns and give me a five and give him a, you know, <laughs> we set up that way. Right. 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 Um, on behalf of Bob and the Standard, thank you guys so much for being here and joining us today. We greatly yeah, appreciate you. your insight and uh, hope everyone got something out of it today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for thank joining us. Okay, thank you.